Greetings, and welcome to the weekly edition of the Safe Crypto Show. I am your host, Tyler Jordan, with co-hosts Mike and Jason. Each episode attempts to cover a range of topics, beginning with a global market cap review and a look at the past week's movers and shakers. Next, a discussion of general crypto news and happenings. Then we consider new and interesting projects and ICOs, all followed by a brief discussion of the weekly tech update by MateSafe. Let's get started with the show. Safe Crypto Show Disclaimer. Please keep in mind at all times that we, the hosts and guests of the Safe Crypto Show, are not offering or giving investment advice. We only state our personal opinions and thoughts on our own interests. By watching, you agree to not hold us responsible for any losses you may incur by executing trades or by maintaining holds based upon the subjects discussed in our episodes. It is Friday, the 7th of September, 2018. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Mike. Welcome, Mike. We have an action-packed show. Yes, we do. Let's get straight into it. The topic number one, the crypto roundup. Just going to look at the top 10 here. Now, probably most everyone's already aware we had a really ruckus week, really big downturn. We're going to be talking about that a bit uh, in the show today. Bitcoin, though, is... uh, Currently stabilized a bit the last 24 hours, only down 0.76%. That's (laughs) 0.76. Ethereum down 5%. Ripple down 3, 3 3.5%. Bitcoin Cash down 3.5%. EOS down 2 and 3 quarters percent. Stellar down uh, 0.85%. So, yeah, it's pretty pretty, uh, marginal. A little bit here, a little bit there. Um, so I think things have uh, stabilized looking back over the past couple of days now. Well, day and a half, I think things have gone a little more stable. So that's good. Let's get on to the weekly total market cap chart. Looks like we started the week at about 229, 230000000000 billion-ish. And then we had that sharp sell-off midweek. And we are finishing the week at around $204 billion. So... Yeah, it's been pretty harsh. Pretty harsh week. Pretty big drop. Pretty big loss of capital. Looks like Bitcoin dominance is now at 54.8%. Move on to Blocktivity. Got EOS at number one still, remaining quite uh, quite firmly in the top dog spot for activity on the blockchain. Uh, BitShares at number two. Steam at number three. Ethereum number four. Bitcoin number five, Waves, Komodo, Ethereum Classic, Bitcoin Cash, Dogecoin, Litecoin rounding up the top 12. You can see uh, still only one coin uh, has unconfirmed transactions, and that's Ethereum. Of course, no surprise there. Today at 74,000 unconfirmed transactions. I don't think that's a peak by any means, but it's uh, still quite high. And uh, still no solution in sight for Ethereum. I think this is just going to keep pushing more developers to looking into alternative smart contract platforms like EOS and a number of others that are coming up, but EOS has certainly got the top dog spot there, I reckon, at the moment. So, topic number two, the Made Safe update. This week, the summary. Doug, Pierre, and Bart will be presenting a deep dive into Parsec at the next Work on Blockchain event in London on Tuesday, September the 11th. Number two, we are delighted to welcome Nikita, who took the decision to relocate to Scotland all the way from Russia. Number three, the routing team have started working on the code for node add remove in Parsec. This is a critical path item in order for Milestone 3 to begin in parallel with remaining Milestone 2 work and therefore uh, deliver Alpha 3, Alpha 3 of the network. It is a rather complex piece of code, and the team are relieved to have it so well specified in the design phase. So marketing, today we finished another video which uh, lets you use the generation of graphs to visualize consensus as it occurs using our Parsec algorithm. Uh, Just a note to viewers, I'm gonna be attaching, well, uh, I'm gonna be putting a link to that video in the show notes. So uh, they're tweaking the video slightly at the moment to fix fix something. This is in process. This is the process being done. The video will be released tomorrow. That's today, actually, because these notes came out yesterday. So we'll update this post as soon as it's live. 
video provides more context to those wanting to poke around in the Parsec code in a bit more depth. So please give it a watch and feel free to share any suggestions or feedback on any other information you might feel to be useful. Doug Campbell will be speaking at the Mathematics for Industry, Blockchain, and Cryptocurrencies conference at Manchester University before joining Pierre Chevalier and Bart in a deep dive of the Parsec Consensus Mechanism at King's College London next Tuesday. So that's really great news. They're getting the word out about Parsec, more and more information out there. Great thing about Parsec is that it's open source. It's not patented code like Hashgraph. So I'm hoping that we'll see more groups start to take an interest in Parsec and start participating in its development and strengthening the code. So recruitment, they're welcoming Nikita, who took the decision to relocate from Scotland to Russia, uh, to Scotland from Russia. Nikita was here earlier in the year for DevCon and has said uh, it feels like he never left and is happy to be back. It's wonderful to know that devs want to come to Scotland and having Nikita located in Air will Air Scotland will enable better collaboration with the rest of the team based at the headquarters there. They're also recruiting for a number of roles at present. They need a Rust engineer, which can be remote. Rust engineer with networking experience can also be remote. And software test engineer based in, at the headquarters in Air Scotland. They need a DevOps based at headquarters and a marketing strategist also based at headquarters. So if you have any of those uh, talents, skills, please get in touch. Uh, MateSafe is recruiting. Safe API and apps. We're moving the Safe Authenticator mobile app to a new repository. A pull request is under review. Okay, I, I probably shouldn't get into all this, uh, but uh, please do. They've got uh, Safe Client Lib Libs uh, information, routing information, crust updates. These are all new updates. I'm not giving any of this the, the benefit it's due, so please do check out the link in the show notes and uh, have a look at what's going on at MadeSafe. All things happening, lots of things happening, big updates, big things happening, big, big, big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not all with it today. I'm not all with it mo most days, but today I'm maybe a little worse. Okay, <clears throat> let's just get into the news. The other news, topic number three, news and updates. So this is an update on patent updates, blockchain patent updates. Uh, there's so many updates, hap um, blockchain, new blockchain patents happening that it's um, it's interesting to, to follow that. We've been following that a lot here on uh, the show. So today we've got uh, Alibaba, IBM ranked top glo globally for a number of blockchain patents filed. I think a couple months ago, um, Bank of America had, was like near the top. So I'm not sure if this is just a new, this is a global, global thing. So maybe that was... Um, Bank of America was in comparison with American patents or U.S. patents. So this is a global global patent list comparison. Tech giants Alibaba and IBM are vying for the top spot on a new list that ranks global entities by the number of blockchain-related patents filed to date, published August 31st by IPR Daily. IPR Daily, a media outlet specializing in intellectual property, says it consolidated data as of August 10th from across China, the EU, America, Japan, and South Korea, as well as consulting the international patent system from the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. China's Alibaba only just seals first place, having filed a total of 90 blockchain-related patents, whereas IBM has to date filed a total of 89. In third place is MasterCard with 80 filings, followed by Bank of America with 53. Fifth on the new list is China's central bank, the People's Bank of China, uh, which has filed a total of 44 patent applications devoted to its project for central bank digital currency. As Cointelegraph has reported, WIPO data has previously indicated that the highest number of patent filings for blockchain technology in 2017 came from China, which filed 225 that year as compared with America's 91 and Australia's 13. China's embrace of the technology is counterbalanced by an increasingly stringent stance against decentralized cryptocurrencies, which has intensified yet further in recent weeks. The split position is mirrored by Alibaba's founder, Jack Ma, who has been vocal in his endorsement of blockchain, even while reserving skepticism for cryptocurrencies. IBM, for its part, has been steadily expanding its involvement in blockchain across diverse fields, recently signing a five-year, $740 million deal with the Australian government to use blockchain and other new technologies to improve data security and automation across federal departments, including defense and home affairs. Home of fears. <laughs> Our next article, 
Deutsche Bourse establishes centrally steered unit dedicated to blockchain and crypto assets. Now, this is another bit of an update. Deutsche Bourse, recently we talked about uh, in previous shows, that has been working to uh, add crypto listings to their to their bourse. And uh, yeah, so that's that's really big news for for adoption, I think, and, and for institutional investment. So what this article is all about here, let's see. Germany's joint stock company, Deutsche Bourse, has established a dedicated unit for blockchain crypto assets. The newly established DLT crypto assets and new market structures unit will comprise a 24 person team led by Jens Hockmeister and will exploit the disruptive potential the technology could have for financial market infrastructure as well as new products uh, Deutsche Bourse could develop to enhance its existing offerings. So it's just an update, but uh, it's good news. It indication they're really taking the, the whole area seriously, and uh, we're going to see a lot more development there, I reckon. Our next article, this is our last in our news and update section. Goldman Sachs CFO report recent reports about crypto trading desk are fake news. Now, this gets into really a big story for the week that uh, the, a day or two before, and uh, about a day and a half before, I guess, early in the morning, there was a report from Business Insider. I'll just go ahead and read this because probably they explain a lot of that in the article. Goldman Sachs Chief Financial Officer Martin Chavez said that recent reports about the company abandoning its plans to open a cryptocurrency trading desk are fake news. Seen CNBC reported this September 6th. As the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference in San Francisco, or at the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference in San Francisco, Chavez reportedly said that reports about the company's intentions for a crypto trading desk were unfounded. Quote, I never thought I would hear myself use this term, but I really have to describe that news as fake news, end quote. Rumors that Goldman Sachs planned to establish a crypto-focused unit by the end of 2018 were initially reported by Bloomberg in December last year. However, on September 5th, Business Insider reported that unnamed sources, unnamed sources, said that the firm is scrapping crypt, its crypto trading, crypto trading desk uh, plans due to an unclear regulatory environment in the crypto industry. Chavez suggested that the excitement over a potential trading desk may have been premature. CNBC quotes him saying, but when we talked about exploring digital assets, it was going to be exploration that would be evolving over time. Maybe someone who was thinking about our activities here got very excited that we would be making markets as principal and physical Bitcoin. And as they got into it, they realized part of the evolution, but it's not here yet, end quote. While Goldman has been clearing and providing liquidity for Bitcoin-linked futures contracts from the CBOE and CME, Chavez said there needs to be a reliable custody solution before the bank can proceed with physical Bitcoin. He stated, quote, physical Bitcoin is something tremendously interesting and tremendously challenging from the perspective of custody. We don't yet see an institutional-grade custody solution for Bitcoin. We are interested in having that exist, and it's a long road. Chavez noted that the company is working on a type of Bitcoin derivative, non-deliverable forwards, which are over-the-counter derivatives settled in U.S. dollars. The reference price is reportedly the Bitcoin USD price established by a group of exchanges. The price of Bitcoin and other digital currencies plummeted following the news about Goldman Sachs canceling plans for a trading desk, fake news, with a total market cap dropping by $12 billion an hour. All of the top 100 coins experience losses over the last 24 hours. Bitcoin is trading. Well, we know what it's trading at. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, so what I, what I hear, what I've been hearing is a lot of people tending to, or a lot of these news organizations and news outlets indicating or pointing the finger at, at this fake news as being the, the reason for the drop. I want to... To discuss though this a little bit because uh, a day or two day and a half before the drop uh, Chris Comey who is the commentator on uh, the cryptoverse which is a YouTube channel I frequent myself you just pull up what he uh, he had a, a video out see it was four days ago now but before the drop Bitcoin shorts increased 50 percent as a hundred million tether moves to Bitfinex. I'm going to link that video in the show notes as well. But uh, 
it, it was a really strong indicator that some big market makers, <laughs> market manipulators, read between the lines, were preparing to dump uh, crypto. So I think this this idea that this um, that this fake news about Goldman Sachs trading desk uh, being the the trigger for this market collapse, I think that's uh, that's smoke and mirrors, folks. I think there was a big fix in the market, and that fake news from unnamed sources was was really just a fake trigger to explain why the markets were dropping, why everybody suddenly woke up at 7 a.m., saw that Business Insider article, and just decided to sell. Uh, I don't think that's what really happened, folks. I think this is real strong indication of major manipulation of the markets. And uh, I really think, uh, I mean, I don't know, it, what is the SEC of the U.S. going to look into this? I doubt it because, well, you know, figure it out for yourself. But I think there's major manipulation going on here. And I think the only re real way to, to thwart it is to hodl hodl hard and, you know, take a loss in the short run. But as long as people hodl hard, these people aren't going to get big gains out of their manipulation. In fact, they'll probably take losses over time. And that's the only way we're going to win against this kind of thing, in my opinion. But do you have any thoughts on this, Mike? I mean, this is a... That's the same, that's the same sort of thing that we've been saying for quite some time is, you know, when the price goes down, you don't lose any money until you actually sell and lock in the losses. And... You know, if someone's doing shenanigans, the one thing that ends up being a detractor to, you know, the shenanigans is a larger and larger and larger market. Now, you know, obviously with a $200 billion market cap, they're able to go and do these sorts of things. But at some point, you know, there will be ongoing investment. And at some point it'll get to the to a situation where they aren't able to go and, and pull the things that they're doing or, you know, situations such like what we just saw, you know, won't come about nearly as frequently, if at all. So yeah. just a matter of time. And as each day progresses, we get more, you know, more projects get closer to, you know, release or, you know, hitting milestones that enhance the quality of their project. And eventually we'll get to a point to where, you know, it's going to be a very rosy scene, for lack of a better yeah. phrase. You know, Once where we've got a lot adoption. of projects. Yeah, a lot of projects that have a lot of good things going for them and, you know, a need and a use case that you've mentioned over, yeah. you know, over a few episodes. So hopefully at some point we'll get to the turnaround where, you know, we will see the markets turn around because people are enthusiastic about the future of crypto rather than the current situationals of, oh, I just want to make money. You yeah. Know? Well, and well, that's what we do is we invest in projects and, you know, we're hodlers. You know, if you want to go and call us hodlers and stuff, which we, we are, I, I figure we're more investors and we like our projects and we just are patient, you know. Yeah, so. I think that's what you got to be in, in these markets. You just got to be patient. You got to hodl, and you, you have to invest by an investment. That means doing your research mm -hmm. yourself, not uh, trusting what uh, other people say, or or particularly, you know, a lot of these news outlets. You got to do your own research, and you got to think about the future. You got to think what what do people need really? What, what do people need down the line? Because that's that's what's going to really support you know, a, a new new kind of economy that, that's going to really support humanity and drive humanity forward. And you got to think, well, what, what are people really, really going to need in the future? That, that's what you need to invest in, because that's that's hardcore. That's something that's that can't be can't be uh, destroyed. Ultimately, I mean, it, it can be attacked. Any any kind of vision can be attacked. But anyway, I'm rambling. <laughs> we'll, we'll discuss the good ones. This. The good ones will weather the storm. So. We'll That's discuss this a little figure. bit more in our discussion today. So let's let's get on to the next uh, topic is adoption news. I've, I've put in a new topic this, this week, um, adoption news, because I, I generally cover adoption news every week, and it's kind of muddled in with the other news. So this, this uh, week I'm going to actually have a separate topic for it. So our first uh, item, survey, half of American millennials are interested in using crypto. A recent survey by research service YouGov Omnibus shows that half of American millennials are interested in using cryptocurrency. The survey, which collected answers from 1,202 respondents from
from August 29th to August 30th, assesses the interest of respondents in using crypto in everyday life. Quote, of the people who believe that cryptocurrencies will become widely accepted, over one third, 36 percent, say they would be interested in converting to primarily using a cryptocurrency rather than the U.S. dollar. However, a majority, 57 percent, say they would not be interested in converting away from the U.S. dollar. Millennials are almost equally split between being interested 48% and not interested 50%. That's, that's still, that's a very significant amount. According to the poll, 79% of Americans know of at least one cryptocurrency. Where Bitcoin appeared to be the most well-known, the leading crypto is familiar to 71% of respondents. Bitcoin is followed by the leading altcoin Ethereum with 13% of participants saying they have heard of it. 87% of those who have heard about Bitcoin have never interacted with it, while 49% of respondents claim they were glad they had not purchased the leading crypto earlier and do not plan to. 15% wish that they had bought Bitcoin earlier and believe it is currently too late to buy it. Of all the participants in the survey, 34% do not think that crypto will become widely accepted, while millennials demonstrated the most positive approach to cryptocurrencies with 44% of them predicting wider adoption. The authors of the survey state that skepticism toward crypto adoption may be linked to the potential use of crypto for illegal purposes. Oh, I doubt that. <laughs> In June, research company Ipsos, on behalf of ING Bank BV, conducted a study which revealed that interest in crypto is expected to double in the future. The survey involved respondents from 15 countries, polling 1,000 people in each. Per the survey, only 9% of respondents own crypto, while 25% said they will own some in the future. 66% of Europeans have heard of cryptocurrency. 35% agreed that crypto is the future of spending online, while 35% said it will increase in value in the following 12 months. So that's, I think, is really positive positive news. Not not unexpected uh, to me, but uh, I mean, millennials are the, the forefront so of what's going on in the crypto revolution and uh, will remain to be so for some time. And uh, it's good to see that uh, they're serious about it. I think that's, that's really positive news. Our next article here in Adoption News, Majority of investors want to buy more digital currency in 2018, survey shows. The majority of accredited and retail investors plan to increase their crypto asset holdings over the next 12 months, according to a survey published September 5th by investment platform Shares Post. The mid-year survey, which was conducted in July, polled 2,490 retail investors and 528 individual accredited and institutional investors. The recent survey shows both consumers and investors remain optimistic about cryptocurrencies in spite of the 60% decline in cryptocurrency valuations in 2018. At least 59% of investors and 72% of consumers confirm they're planning to buy more coins in the next 12 months. Moreover, 57% of investors and 66% of consumers expect crypto valuations to grow next year. Respondents were also asked to rank cryptocurrencies by preference. Bitcoin was most preferred, followed by Ethereum, Ripple, and Litecoin. According to the survey, respondents found that these four cryptocurrencies have the most potential for long-term success. Furthermore, participants increasingly expressed interest in blockchain technology. 32% of investors and 49% of consumers say their employers are interested in implementing blockchain in the near future. Both consumers and investors think the success of blockchain integration mostly depends on the prevalence of relevant commercial applications and proper education on, te on the technology. 50% of respondents said crypto market volatility was their chief concern, while 37% said their main concern was security. As Cointelegraph previously reported, a poll conducted by research service YouGov on the bus in August shows that half of American millennials are interested in using cryptocurrency. We just covered that article a few minutes ago. Moreover, at least 79% of Americans know of at least one cryptocurrency. So again, really nice positive survey news. I mean, at the end of the day, folks, these surveys are probably our, our closest way to take a pulse of what's going on because the, there's a lot of you know, random kind of static news, news from news from a static background of, you know, there's so many insiders like who are who are spreading false news and fake news to manipulate the markets. And you know, these surveys, while they can be manipulated, uh, I think you know, in, you got to take every bit of news with a grain of salt. But at least with a survey, you 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 possibly are getting some real kind of feel to what people are are thinking and feeling in general. And that's, that's really, this is so, so far what I'm seeing is, is really positive for crypto in the longer run. 
Okay, so that brings us to topic five, our weekly discussion. And this week, we have hyper-Bitcoinization, how currency crises are driving nations to crypto. Now, we've got a lot of currency crises happening all over the globe, and they seem to be expanding. I mean, they, they tend to trigger more crises, you know, and this could really zip out of control pretty quickly. And this has been kind of threatening to happen around the globe for well over a decade now, but uh, we're seeing we're seeing the signs of you know a tipping point at hand with major uh, major currencies of, of various fairly uh, big nations start to have problems. I mean, Turkey is one example. Um, Italy uh, is is maybe on the brink of, of one. You know, Spain possibly could be on the brink. Uh, so there's a lot of tipping points that uh, that are, are coming coming about through through debt crises and and a lot of stress upon a lot of economies uh, across the globe. I mean, a lot of these uh, uh, sanctions, uh, economic sanctions that are being put put on by the U.S. and and uh, and some of these trade sanctions uh, and and just these uh, the breakdown of, of trade in general with uh, uh, what do they call that, Mike? The uh, what Trump has been doing, putting on uh, uh, the tariffs, putting on tariffs or threatening tariffs, all, all these sort of things, you know, can lead to, to currency crises down the, down the track. So uh, this is this is a huge deal. And uh, the question this article is posing is, how, how is that going to affect the adoption of crypto? So let's have a look and see what uh, I'll just read the open. This is a really long article and I'm not going to I'm not going to go through it. It's, of course, linked in the show notes. I'm going to read the first couple of paragraphs. We're going to have a look at some of the graphs, the charts in, in here. So <clears throat> let's just start out. Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, and Zimbabwe, these countries are all facing ongoing economic crises. They're suffering from high levels of inflation, and as a result, the people living within them are increasingly turning to crypto as a store of value and a means of exchange. Their recent troubles have heightened the distant possibility that at some point in the future, hyper-Bitcoinization, should be hyper Crypto organization, I think, will take place with Bitcoin or some other coin replacing the Bolivar, the Lira, the Real, and other struggling national currencies, and perhaps even becoming the world's dominant form of money as predicted by the likes of Steve Wozniak and Jack Dorsey. However, as encouraging as such developments are for Bitcoin's reputation as a store of value, it's unlikely that the moves of Turkish, Venezuelan, and Zimbabwean citizens toward it and other cryptocurrencies are an immediate precursor to kinds of blanket adoption processes outlined in the noted 2014 hyper-Bitcoinization article by Daniel uh, Krawitz, Krawitz. Even though they're conspicuously increasing, the Bitcoin volumes traded in the affected countries are not significant enough relative to global volumes, while the isolated nature of most of these nations means that adoption has little chance of spreading outward. I, one, one other thing they mentioned in this article that I think is important to consider is during the a country, when a country has one of these crises, it, whether they implement capital controls and try to block the block people from, say, buying U.S. dollars or buying gold or buying buying anything else, you know, aside from crypto, because it's really hard to block the purchase of crypto. Um, but aside aside from if if they implement these capital controls, then that really constrains the market and forces a lot of it, drives a lot of it into buying crypto as opposed to U.S. dollars or some other external currency that may have more stability. So, uh, you know, it's it's not purely a matter of of uh, whether they have a crisis or not. It's also how the government reacts to that crisis and what they do uh, as to whether crypto is more uh, adopted in that country or not. So let's just look at the first uh, example here, the Venezuela, the textbook case of crisis-driven crypto adoption is Venezuela, with the first report on Venezuelans turning to Bitcoin arriving in October 2014. According to Reuters, Venezuelans were being driven to the cryptocurrency by the capital controls imposed by President Hugo Chavez in 2003, which made it excruciatingly hard for them to obtain U.S. dollars. Given that, even then, hyperinflation was in motion in Venezuela at 68.5%. Locals began purchasing and mining Bitcoin, which stood at $388.30 at the time, uh, at the beginning of October of that year, despite having fallen by around 49% since the beginning of that, of that year, that's 2014. 
Uh, while data on the actual number of people using Bitcoin at this point isn't available, the Reuters article states that Venezuela, quote, already had at least several hundred Bitcoin enthusiasts. And somewhat less vaguely, Coindance records that 625,573 Venezuelan Bolivar, the EF, was traded for Bitcoin on the local Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer crypto exchange in the week of December 12, 2014, equivalent to about uh, 99,000 uh, US dollars at the conversion rate of the time. Similarly, crypto compare lists a high uh, for 2014 on December 24th uh, at VEF 553,633, which at the at around which is around uh, 87, uh, nearly 88 thousand US dollars underlies how the volumes being traded weren't massive, particularly for a nation with a gross domestic product of 482 billion, even if they were growing as a result of economic pressures. So here we got the uh, volume of uh, VEF, that's the Venezuelan Bolivar uh, versus the Bitcoin market. This is from the local Bitcoins exchange. So that's where this data comes from. And we can see uh, this, this covers um, from 20, 2013 through the present. We can see a, a pretty massive rise, though. I mean, uh, 2014, that's what we talked about in the previous paragraph here. You can see it's pretty low, but that, that's, um, that's gone up by, uh, you know, an order of magnitude um, since then, at least, you know, tenfold. <clears throat> so pretty significant uh, changes are happening. And this is just Bitcoin, folks. So, um, and in fact, in Venezuela, uh, one of the bigger ones now is Dash. Uh, so it's not just... A, Bitcoin and Dash actually has a wider use case in, in Venezuela now with a lot of a lot of retailers um, who are accepting crypto are actually preferring Dash over Bitcoin because of the speed of the transactions. Um, and so, yeah, this is a this is, a, I think, a indicative of what we may see as more currency crisis come into play, uh, it, especially, I mean, if, if the U.S. dollar eventually, well, say that the, the EU, the, the euro comes comes into into having some difficulty, probably before the U.S. dollar, but uh, and, and the Chinese yuan, you know, we we, I mean, China's put in some pretty big blocks on cryptocurrency, so getting getting it into the country is pretty difficult through the Great Firewall, uh, I assume. But um, the people still find a way, and and uh, even if it's <laughs> you know by a USB stick across the border, <laughs> it will find a way in. And, and as these currencies continue, some of these bigger currencies start to have problems like the euro, the US dollar, and, and the Chinese yuan. I think there's, there's not going to be, who, who are you going to turn to? Because I mean, if, if just one of them starts to go like the euro or the yuan, then you know, probably there will be a flood of interest in purchasing the US dollar. Uh, but as, as they all start to, to move downwards, which seems inevitable given the, the huge global debt loads and so many of them are interdependent upon each other for their value, and I, I think we'll, we're going to see them all start to depreciate. And that's going to, to ultimately drive a lot more adoption into the crypto markets. Uh, I, don't, I don't really see uh, an option there for most people. I mean, uh, there is gold, of course, but it's not so easily tradable uh, as crypto is. So uh, it's really interesting to see what happens there. Do you have any any thoughts so far, Mike? And what have well, uh, just going through the various different you know charts and such. I mean, it varies based on the countries that they mentioned, and that's you know you've yeah. got uh, Venezuela, Iran, Zimbabwe, Turkey, and then they they go through the cryptocurrency ownership chart, which is further down. And yeah. I found that chart to be really interesting as far well, as for you want to where, go to that. We can. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. And so one of the things I thought look at? The, the cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency ownership. ownership chart? Yeah. They got, you know, the number of people in the countries that we own go. cryptos yeah. and 18%. 18%. In, yeah. yeah. That's, that's and, huge, isn't it? And then, you know, seeing countries like Romania and Poland, you know, they don't really right. have the, you know, they don't really have the, the um, crisis like Zimbabwe or, or Venezuela. No, not yet, yet. No. Yet economically, you know, they don't have a very, you know, very stellar position on a, on you know on a world scale. But yet, the people that live there obviously have seen the value in in the cryptos, and it shows a lot when you see, you know, a large number of you know large number of ten, twelve, fifteen, eighteen percent. You know, that's that's pretty pretty impressive. It you know, is especially at this particular. It's surprising point. too. Yeah, it's surprising. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, it's going to be nice when that's it's the the lowest amounts of the country's you know ownerships are at the four or five percent. When we get countries at thirty percent, forty percent, fifty percent, that's going to be the interesting time. Is yeah. when there's you know when those percentages rise into the you know into well into the double digits, you know closer to the you know one third, one half, and you know two thirds. Once we start running into the very large adoption rates, that's going to be the really exciting time for me, you know, in my mind, is watching yeah. as the as the adoption rate goes up to a significant amount. I think that another really important aspect of that is is as adoption goes up, we're going to see more retailers start to to say, "Yeah, I'll accept that. I'll I'll take that cryptocurrency X, Y, or Z." Mm-hmm. Um, for product and and that will will basically because if it's just if it's just adoption right if it's just people buying it like a, a gold or something then then it's gonna it's gonna be uh, really held hostage to to the manipulators because just just like they manipulate the price of gold anything that that people don't actively trade on the markets but just hold is really susceptible to manipulation. Because if if ninety percent of of a cryptocurrency is held by the public in general, right, people who are just hodling, and they just have it packed away, it, even if only ten percent, you know, are manipulators, if if they're the ones actively trading, they can they can destroy the price, they can wipe the price out, they they can move it up and down because the price doesn't depend on 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 what what people who are holding holding it th- think it's worth uh, in general because they're not actively trading it. And it's that active trading that actually sets the price. So getting more adoption, I think, will lead to more retail use, will lead to ultimately to more actual trading of, of cryptocurrencies. And that in itself, to, to my mind, will really push the manipulators, marginalize them, and reduce their influence in the sphere overall. And yeah. That's something that, you know, going back to that article earlier about, you know, uh, some of the manipulation that happened this week, it just really, it really irks me. I just, I'm frustrated to see that. And, and, uh, I just, oh, I just can't explain how angry it makes me, but you yeah. know, at the end of the day, there, there's, it's just something we're going to have to deal with until we get the adoption and get the actual, get actual goods and services priced in crypto. You know, how much is that, is, is that box of bananas there? Oh, that's, you know, five dash or something, you know? Oh, okay. When more and more people see goods and services priced in cryptocurrency, then they get a sense of how much it's worth. And then if they see the price being pushed down by manipulators, they'll go, oh, that's a bargain. I'm going to buy that. And then they're going to come in and buy it. But when they don't really have any idea what it's worth because they don't have anything to compare it to except some other cryptocurrencies, then the manipulators are going to win. They're going to continue to win. And I don't want to, I don't want to see that happen you know, for too much longer. I'm hoping that, that, uh, that things will start to change in time. But... Uh, yeah. I reckon, you know, it's, it really is just a matter of time because there's so many countries now who are facing currency crises and it's uh, the global economy is has been just maxed out with debt. I mean, the, the debts are enormous. The And, and in particular, the, the housing bubbles, because so much of the market depends on fractional reserve banking, which is itself dependent upon mortgage industry and loans, big loans, car loans. Uh, and it's just it's it's pushed to the hilt. And that hilt really is is where the central banks set their interest rates. That that's that's what that's how you know things are bad because central banks have their interest rates at at really all time lows globally, and and they can't. That means they can't really go. The only thing they can do beyond that is go to negative interest rates. And really, we got to thank crypto for coming about when it did because it's really forced central banks to to to, to try to stabilize a little bit. Because if they were to go into negative interest rate territory there would be massive currency crises. People would already be, be flocking to crypto in, in a big way. But at the same time, that would, that would be causing a lot of economic instability. And so what, what's happened with crypto coming in early, in my opinion, uh, at, when it did, is that it, it's, 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 it's going to lead to a more smooth transition to, to crypto over time, as opposed to a real rough transition that could have caused a lot of economic collapse and instability. I mean, we might still have that, but... Uh, I mean, I feel like it's it's probably brought a little stability and slowed things down a bit, and and had a, caused a little uh, a sense to come into the markets a bit. Uh, competition is always good. That's what I think. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree on that. And as far as for the, you know, the adoption compared with the large crisis, 
you know, how much adoption happens prior to the the huge, you know, huge uh, financial crisis. That's the that's the key point. And having any number of different ways to pay for, you know, anything you want at this point, you know, since there isn't a, a large number of, of businesses adopting the, yeah, I'll take crypto for it, you know, on their pricing, you know, we have to rely on, on the easier it is to convert out without having to go through the rigmarole of, you know, having an exchange, go and send it to your bank and all that stuff when you have a company that, you know, has a crypto card that functions on the Visa MasterCard network for, you know, for a lot of people yeah. having yeah. something like that, That'll that, be trans great yeah, that and, transforms and the use. ability. Yeah. And you're, you know, the thing is, is that now granted, you know, the, the Visa MasterCard system charges for all the transactions, they still do that, but the easier it is to convert, you know, convert out of crypto, that helps, you know, as much as if not more than it's the ability to easily, yeah, the ability to easily convert into crypto. And once we little... get the adoption, that that that's really going to start to trigger because when when a business is selling goods and services and they see people coming in and say, oh, what's that weird looking card you got there? Oh, you know, oh, it's just a Mastercard, Visa card, whatever, but but it uses crypto, and the retailer is going, oh, so you're actually using cryptocurrency? Pay? Yeah, I am. And as they as this you know that people will tell people talk to each other right so yeah th this word's going to spread fast and once that that starts to, to kick in then retailers are going to be huh i wonder if there's a cheaper way that i can i can just accept crypto directly and cut out visa mastercard yep. and then they'll be like oh yeah well there is oh there are ways i can do and then boom you know well, uh, i think the biggest <laughs> it's going to really start to open up a lot of doors the biggest bonus i can think of for retailers is that there aren't any chargebacks. You don't have yeah. chargebacks with crypto. And that's a huge part of every big business is dealing with chargebacks. And if you don't have to worry about that, it doesn't have to mean that you're not going to give refunds. That's right. You, but, you just negotiate you know, with your customer, you know, yeah. and it's, it's and it, between it, you and the customer and it's not between some arbitrary firm right. like PayPal that just says, no, we just don't do that. End of story. <laughs> yeah. Or, <laughs> they, over, or we, know. we've, we've reversed the transaction. Well, yeah. what does that leave me? I've sent out the product. Yeah, that's you right. Know. It's and happened as to me. Far as, I, I've been really, really, uh, uh, disappointed bad language i've been really i've been really uh financially injured by paypal once when uh, they 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 really hurt me i i sent out a product a very expensive product and it was returned to me uh completely damaged uh, i sent it out as as a really good quality product and it was sent back uh, in without without full packaging pro properly packaged and it was I mean, maybe it was damaged before and they, they just did it that way, but it came back completely broken and PayPal wouldn't, uh, wouldn't help me out. They just refunded the guy. And that was that. Yeah. I sent them pictures. It didn't matter. They didn't care. Yeah. yeah anyway, my sob story won't go into that <laughs> anymore. Well, that's the, that's the thing is that, is that when you start working and dealing with crypto on an ongoing basis as a merchant, then your rep your reputation is what the customer goes by. And if you're, yeah. a, you know, unless you're a shady businessman who who doesn't honor, you know, honor their customers and the needs of their customers and stuff, then you don't have a problem with it. If you're an honest, upright, you know, businessman that's going to go yeah. and take care of their customers, whether they're, you know, whether they're getting refunds or looking to buy additional products and stuff. So, but the way anyway. I see it is crypto really gets, really gets a lot of the, the advantages with not much of the downside and with the customers, you start looking for reputable businesses to deal, to deal with when you start dealing with cryptos. And that's, you know, that's a huge, huge major thing. And I would just be tickled in regards to this article. I'd be tickled to see what would happen if a country decided to do the, okay, we're on crypto now. Well, you know, and, Iran's and talking about it. Uh, Iran's talking about issuing their own cryptocurrency. Uh, hopefully they would do it a little uh, better than what Venezuela's does with their fraudulent Petro. It seems yeah. to be a fraudulent <clears throat> issuing, but uh, I, Backed I, by I, open I know, source but, crypto. <laughs> Backed by open source crypto and stuff. We are we are shuffling off the the you know 
the beast of fiat currency and we have open source crypto this is this is our crypto and this is our code and this is what you must buy if you're going to deal with our country uh, i'm 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 not too fond personally of, of the you know s status uh, coin but in any case it, it would be it would be a doorway a gateway to to getting more into you know better independent uh blockchains or independent projects like uh, Safecoin down the road. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, any, anything that, that gets us uh, there faster uh, and smoothly is, is good. So uh, I just, I think this is a really great article. It's really well done. It's by Simon Chandler over on uh, Cointelegraph. Of course, the links will be in the show notes. Please do have a, have a read of it if you have time. It is a long article, but it's, uh, it's well worth the read and there's a lot of information in it. So that's all we have for today, folks. I'd like to thank every one of you for joining the show. Your support is very appreciated. We hope you found the episode informative and helpful. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share a video with others, and tune in next week for another interesting episode. Talk to you again soon, peeps. Bye-bye.